Kingdom Hearts Final Mix. Generally, it's seen as an upgrade from the vanilla version of the game. There's a few things that people have opinions about, let's say. One of those is the Heartless Recolors. I certainly have my own thoughts about that, which I've shared before. But the other main point of contention are the new special Heartless they added to the game. These 10 troublesome little things, they really made the synth grind a more complex affair. It used to be back in the vanilla version of the game. You had to just grind different Heartless. You might have had to deal with some white mushrooms or rare truffles for those mystery goos, a few rare ingredients, but generally it was quite simple. But now we've got these 10 new Heartless and they all have their own individual mechanics that you have to deal with. You have to think a bit more, practice perhaps, maybe even look up online what to do. And that makes the synth thing a more difficult experience and for a lot of people completely put them off. There's plenty of people I know who haven't got Ultima on Final Mix because they just don't think it's worth the hassle of dealing with all these Heartless. For my part, I've done the Ultima grind twice, but to make sure it was all fresh in my mind, I decided to fight every single one of them again, one after the other, I did it on stream, and I had a retirement age level character, Sora was level 64, which felt kind of appropriate for doing these. I didn't want to do it on a level 100 save because I'd be very, very powerful, probably too powerful, not really a fair comparison, but I didn't really want to do it on level 50 or something lower level because I feel like when it's sensible to do a lot of these Heartless is when you're a bit more powerful. Of course you can fight these guys earlier, but for the post Hollow Bastion special Heartless, some of them get buffed like the Sniper Wild. It made sense to do it on this kind of level range. So what I'm going to do on this video, if you couldn't already tell what a ranking video is, is order them from worst to best, based on my findings and the notes that I made while fighting them. So let's begin. And number 10, right at the bottom of the pile, is the Jet Balloon. This one is a thick boy, it's quite a chonker, and I'm not really a huge fan of it. What it does is it flies around the deck of Hook's ship, the Jolly Roger. It always seeks to get away from you, and if you take too long to kill it, it would disappear. If you do manage to defeat it in time, you will be rewarded with a 100% guaranteed Dazzling Stone drop, plus a 20% chance of an additional drop. However, you won't be rewarded these if you kill it with less than 100 money on your person. Street rat. And why is money related to this? Well, it's because the jet balloon can send these missile divers, and yes, these are recolors of the screw divers, just as the jet balloon is a recolor of the aqua tank from Atlantica. These missile diver torpedoes, when they hit you, they'll actually cause you to drop money, and quite a lot of it too. So if you don't use a roger, you're just gonna lose all your money on this fight and that's pretty terrible. It also has this spinning move where it sends the missile divers out in all directions. It just continually backs away from you. It can be a little bit irritating, but okay, it's not too bad to deal with. Use a roger and just keep close to it. You can't really use magic because it's very resistant to all magic types. But with the necessary strength, you can defeat it without running out of time as long as you stay close as much as possible. However, there's one other problem that comes into play here, and that is gravity. Uh, not the spell, of course. Rather, what can happen is you'll defeat the jet balloon and get your Dazzling Stone reward, but before you can pick it up, it will fall. A lot of the time you'll be at the side of the jet balloon, you'll do the final hit, and it will plop out of the other side. And if Balloon Boy is not above the ship when this happens, there's a good chance that your Dazzling Stone may fall into the briny depths below. So how do you deal with this? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. One is just to make sure you kill it above the ship, or what I like to do, and that's cast stop right before dealing the final blows, and then flying underneath the big bulk as it unfreezes. This gives the prizes a better chance of being collected, especially with all your treasure magnets equipped. Magnets! Oh! Overall, this thing is like James Corden's Heartless obnoxious and something I'd rather just ignore. It's not difficult when you're set up well, but eh, I don't really care for it. The garage! Hey fellas, the garage! Well, ooh la dee da, Mr. Frenchman! Next up is the Black Ballard. This one... Uh, exists. For what it's worth, I kind of like the design. Sure, it's a recolor, but it's a little bit more special looking than the rest of the Requiem-styled Heartless. What this thing is, it's one of those ball in the cup games, we're all familiar with that. One of them will pop up and you have to track that one as it moves around and tries to get itself lost in the others, and then finds a new position. You go up and hit the right one, and you get a bit of a reward. There's a 10% chance of a lightning stone if you hit the right one, a pretty small chance, because really what they want you to do with this mini game is to hit four correctly. Now you have, I think it's six or seven tries to do this before they disappear. 
but if you manage to hit four of them, then you would get a 100% guaranteed lightning stone drop. If you manage to do that, because the thing with this enemy is, the first two phases where it moves, it's pretty slow and it's not too hard to track. You can do it just by looking, maybe hovering your finger across the screen and keeping it matched to where it is. But it's after that on the third and fourth movements where things get a lot trickier. It gets very fast, they can get bunched up together and you can very easily lose sight of the one you are tracking. One way to mitigate this is with pausing the game. It gives your brain a little bit more time to react. You can keep an eye on it better, but it's no guarantee. There's still going to be times where you're simply unlucky. This little musical themed magician can be kind of stressful to deal with. The distance is important as well, because if you're too close, then you won't be able to see the full range of their movements. If you're too far away and you pause, there's a good chance you're out of combat at that distance, and you'll go into the menu instead of the basic pause screen. And that's no help at all, you can't see anything. And let's not even start with Goofy's snout getting in the way. Hello! So yeah, I don't particularly like this one. I wouldn't say it's horrendous to deal with or anything, but it's not a particularly fun game to me. It's just fine, and then sometimes frustrating. Boom. Hit shot. Sniper's a good job, mate. <laughs> I bet a lot of you guys thought the Sniper Wild was going to be right at the bottom. Well, it's pretty close to that, but there are a few things I do like about this infamous monkey. Now, to go over what it does, to begin with, a lone sniper wild will be spawned in the second district in Traverse Town. You have to defeat it without it spotting you with its searchlights and calling for reinforcements. As soon as those reinforcements come, they will start shooting at you, and that's it, you just gotta leave the room, you can't defeat it after that. If you do manage to defeat it, two more will appear and then you have to deal with them. Of course, dealing with more than one at once can be a problem, so you might have to wait for them to split up a bit, or manage them, maybe stop one while you're hitting the other one. When you defeat those two, three will appear, and this is definitely the most difficult part of the operation. If you do manage to defeat all three, a new set will start, and we'll start again from one, go to two, and go to three. In total, there are five sets, which means 30 monkeys to defeat. But every couple of sets, a new mechanic is introduced to make it more difficult. On the third set of Sniper Wilds, they start dropping these banana peels. Just like their bouncy wild cousins, you can trip over these and lose your money. One nice thing though is that they can also trip over them. There's even a 20% chance of an ether when they do this. Then, when you get to the last two sets, they begin to shoot at you. They haven't called reinforcements, they haven't spotted you. But they somehow know where you are and will aim in your direction to try and trip you up and not let you get close. It's a little bit unnerving to see this, to be honest. And how about the rewards? How do they work? Well, when you defeat six, which is the last one of the first set, you have a 35% chance of getting a power stone. When you defeat 12, you get a 50% chance. 18 is 60%, 24 is 100% guaranteed. And if you defeat all 30 Sniper Wild, you get a guaranteed two power stone drops. So if you do well at this and get right to the end, you're gonna find yourself with a lot of stones, like one of those weird energy crystal hippies. My record is 27, which honestly surprised me. It did take using a fair few items to manage this, but you won't need items for the first two or three sets. A lot of magic and Goofy having MP gift, and that's enough. The Sniper Wild are the most infamous of the special Heartless. There's a few reasons for that. I think one is they appear quite early in the game. They appear in Traverse Town, so it's very likely the first one you come across, and they leave quite an impression. To new players playing Final Mix for the first time. They fight this thing, they don't realise what the mechanics are, it sees them. Suddenly there's a whole bunch of them spawning and having a bit of a monkey uh, can't say the word on YouTube. Really the tactics for this one, I find it's best to come up with whatever works for you, although I have read that Mushu can be quite effective. So to give some quick final thoughts. Sometimes it can be a bit of fun, especially when you start racking them up and you're using strategies but sometimes they just refuse to cooperate and it's irritating. Sometimes they see you and you're not really sure why. So there is a bit of fun to be had, but I think that's diminished by the number of power stones you need to collect and it can end up as a chore. Sorry about that. 
So yeah, the Pink Agaricus. Bursting with personality this one, it's the bubbliest heartless you'll ever find. And I'm going to talk about the Deep Jungle one here because the Atlantica one is pretty much pointless. But when you first enter the treehouse, you'll encounter three white mushrooms you have to cast stop on. They can be in a few different locations, quite often one likes to be in the boat, and the others can be high or low in the treehouse. Once they're gone, the Pink Agaricus will appear and thud to the ground. If you fought Sabora a second time up here and had her make the hole, the Agaricus will actually fall down the hole and you have to deal with it down on the netting, otherwise it's inside the main treehouse room. Now the gimmick here is you have to stop the Agaricus while it's dancing, and land as many hits as possible. It's yet another of these special heartless where stop and arrow are your main tools. Once the stop wears off, the Agaricus will bounce around, depending on how many hits you did, and reward you accordingly. The drop rates are a little bit interesting for this one. So if you get 40 hits, there's a 10% chance of dropping a Serenity Power. 50 hits, there's another 10% chance. 60 hits, there's another 10% chance. Then, once you get to 70 hits, there's a 20% chance, the same for 80 and the same for 90. If you manage to get 100 hits, you are guaranteed to get a Serenity Power and a Prime Cap and a Mystery Goo. So what does this mean? Because these don't stack together. For example, if you got 70 hits, you don't have 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 20 equals 50. You don't have one 50% chance. Rather, you have three 10% chances and a 20% chance. This means that even when you do fairly well at this, there's a potential you won't get anything because you've missed all those smaller chances. That feels quite sucky and it's the reason this isn't higher on the list, because I actually do enjoy doing the Pink Agaricus minigame. Uh, the main method for this is you equip Ragnarok, you put Arrow on, you stop it and you make sure you're targeting the head. You do Ragnarok and you ensure that you press Triangle or Y at the exact right moment for Ragnarok right before it's about to end to get the most amount of shots. Your Aroga is doing plenty of hits in the meantime, and there's a moment between each Ragnarok where you can't do it immediately, so just take that time to do some Arrow combos. Repeat that and you'll be able to get pretty high up. Getting this footage, I managed to get to 87 hits and I got 3 drops on that try. And then the next try, I got 92 hits, I think that's the most I've ever gotten. And I got 1 drop, just goes to show what I was saying about the drop rates. When it works and you do it correctly, it's pretty fun. But then it comes to actually grinding this for items for the Serenity Power and that's where it really falls down in my opinion. Because this is one of the most annoying to grind. And Serenity Power is one of the items you need to get the most of for the synth. See, here's the thing, there's a lot of work involved in this. You need the white mushrooms to spawn if they haven't, and you've got to go back two rooms to get them to spawn again, hopefully. Then you've got to go around stopping all three of them. Agaricus appears, you set up, you do your thing. Ideally, you do it pretty well, and then you pray for some drops. Also, spare a thought back to the PS3 version, where people had to hide Donald and Goofy, because when they hit the pink Agaricus, it would actually minus points from the total. In the subsequent versions, they made it so they didn't attack at all. But I remember back in PS3, you had to hide them around the side and you had to summon Bambi so they wouldn't spawn. And oh, it was all very strange. So it's a tricky one, but the way it is, I think this is the best place to put it. And as I mentioned, there's one in Atlantica, but uh, I don't know why it's there. It's very weird. It's not useful at all. You can get to like 60 hits maybe, but you can't do any special abilities like Ragnarok. So why they put one there, I don't know. I, ain't afraid of no sleep. I, ain't afraid of no bed. I feel like this one might be somewhat controversial. From what I could see in my stream chat, the Grand Ghost was not well liked. This is of course because of its mechanic. You need to deal damage to his health bar by giving him healing items. You can give him magic replenishing items, but they won't damage the health bar. Instead, they'll just stun him, which can be useful if you need a bit of time to get some healing items in. Why would you need that time? Well, because the Grand Ghost is always trying to get you away, trying to push you away from him and make it so the item doesn't hit him, and instead ends up being given to Goofy. Uh, Goofy! Oh, as an aside, I do want to say I quite like the design of this one. It's one of the search ghosts, but bigger and with red, and I like red. So as I'm sure you're painfully aware, the higher quality the healing item you use, the more damage will be done to the health bar and the closer you'll get to defeating it. You'll get a guaranteed frost stone if you deplete the health bar all the way. Any additional frost stones you get depends on what items you use. If you use a mega potion, there's a 5% chance, a mega ether, a 10% an elixir, a 35% chance, and with a mega elixir, a guaranteed frost stone plus a 20% chance of another one. However, using mega elixirs on this is quite a hard ask, and yeah, even I don't do that. 
Megalixes can't really be farmed. Elixirs, on the other hand, can, and they're not too hard to come by in this game. So, with the Grand Ghost, what I do is just use two elixirs, and I'll usually get two drops by doing that, sometimes even three. I understand why the bad reputation is here. It's annoying because you want to use the elixir, it's the most effective thing, but you don't want to waste it on Goofy accidentally. Well, you can reload a save if you mess up, that's an option, but honestly, with good positioning and timing, and perhaps the help of stuns, I don't think this oversized ghoul is too problematic. That's why I kind of like this one, I suppose it's a bit biased of me because I find it quite simple, and you don't have to get that many frost stones. And it's like using a healing item on an undead or a healing spell in certain games. Uh, I think there's a Final Fantasy connection here to using a phoenix down. I don't know, I think it's a cool mechanic, so that's why it's middle of the pack. Just follow my and sneak around. At number 5 we have one of the most simple special heartless in Final Mix, the Stealth Soldier. It's got a 35% chance of dropping an energy stone when you defeat it, and that's it, that's all you have to do, defeat it. Of course, easier said than done, because this thing is quite vicious, they're aggressive little buggers. They appear in Hollow Bastion in either of the two halls, the entrance or the Grand Hall, and there's three that spawn in each room. They're invisible to begin with, although you can make them visible, either through attacking or using stop and stop is definitely a useful tool here. They move around so quickly and constantly dart away and dash towards you, that's stopping them for a while to get some damage in, and even just to catch up with them. It's highly recommended. I like the idea of these guys being a more dangerous but otherwise normal Heartless. There's nothing particularly gimmicky or special about this, you don't have to do some mini game. they are simply more powerful soldiers. True, they can get annoying sometimes, and the higher up your levels and the more equipment you have, the easier they get to deal with, naturally. At level 64 I didn't have a lot of problems, but I have experienced some of the earlier levels doing these, in the 40s or 50s even, that they can do a lot of damage and they're not so easy to defeat. But still, not too bad overall, and that's really all I have to say. Alright, I gotta be honest, it's getting a bit difficult to rank these now, so I'm just gonna go with my gut and put them in an order, but on a different day my opinion could change. Just know that this ranking business isn't too serious, it's really only a format for me to make a video like this around and talk about these heartless. SHADOW! So I've decided to place the Gigas Shadow at number 4. It's always been a bit of a funny name this one, I've said it before, but Gigas Shadow, it could have been Giga Shadow. That might have rolled off the tongue a little better than Gigas Shadow. And yeah, it's got nothing to do with the Gigas from Toy Box in Cage 3, don't worry about that. You can tell when they're going to spawn because a load of little shadows will appear first in the bizarre room. And it's a very appropriate room for this because of course that's a room where you can grow and shrink. And these are bigger shadows. You could say the big ones are like normal shadows when looking at it from the perspective of being the right size for the room. After defeating the three waves of little shadows, seven of these big boys will appear. And the gimmick is that you cannot be hit. If one of them hits you, it will disappear. So, of course, use a roger to deflect most of the attacks. They can still sneak a hit through that, so be careful. But simply take them down and don't give them much of a chance to do hits on you. You could use magic from a distance, perhaps. Or go aggressive and make sure while you're hitting one and keeping it staggered, the others don't come and scratch at you. The more you defeat, the better chance you have of collecting a fury stone. So if you defeat three, you'll get a 10% chance. Defeating four, a 20% and then 35%, 50% for 6, and if you defeat all 7, you'll have 2 guaranteed Fury Stone drops. That's pretty good. It's not that difficult to defeat 7 of these. Now this isn't like the Serenity powers, it's not like if you defeat 7 you'll get those 2 guaranteed and plus all those chances from before, it's just that the last one you kill will take into account how many you killed in total, and it will drop accordingly. It's also a great place for Lucid Shards, not only have you got a bunch of shadows to farm them from beforehand, but the large guys will also drop Lucid Shards, and the percentages of those as you build up the kills are 10, 20, 35, 50, 100, 100, 100. I like these. Yeah, the design is pretty simple, but it's still cool to see big shadows. Extra thick! They're not particularly difficult to deal with, and you can approach them in your own way. You're not forced to do some specific strategy. That person at the word. So I've long held that the Chimera was my favourite of these special Heartless, but that opinion has changed a bit, at least at the moment. I think it definitely has got the coolest design, it's completely original, it's not a recall of some other Heartless, and it's a bit of a Frankenstein's monster collection of different lab parts. The experiment from Cage 2 seems to take some cues from this. Chimera is an appropriate name since that was an amalgamation of different beasts, a mythical creature. 
It's another one that's not too difficult to deal with. First you've got to get down this temporary health bar and once that's done it will throw out all these heads which you have to deflect back into it. You'll get tech points and it will do the most damage to the main health bar. Just hitting it does a little bit of damage but not as much as returning the heads. You might think this would call for some kind of strategy but the way it stands on top of this rock to summon the gargoyles strategy doesn't really come into play here at least for me. I've always found that equipping a roger and going to town on it it's going to deflect the heads on its own. Sure, a couple of them might escape, you could try and smack those back in. But any time I've tried to be more strategic and hit them back in, Sora has ended up auto-targeting into a gargoyle or the Chimera itself. So why bother? A Roga and smacking away at it works just fine. And I suppose that's one reason that it goes a bit down in my estimation. It isn't too hard to deal with, which is nice, but it's not interesting either. You don't really have to do anything but a roger and smack away. Not that I'd want it to be annoying in place of this. That's why it's still in the top three. Just a couple of things that bring it down. Another one would be the run you have to do to respawn it. Of course, you have to go two rooms away to respawn Heartless. Yeah, there's Encounter Plus, but Encounter Plus, from my experience, messes with the Special Heartless, messes with their spawns, so you have to go two rooms away. And here in Oogie's Manor, what's left of it, to do that you've got to go into the previous area, the bridge, and then you've got to take the little platform, light it up with fire, take that back to the Moonlight Hill, then you've got to interact with the hill again. It's a bit more involved than most of the respawning runs you do with these Special Heartless. Oh, and let's not forget it spends a lot of time on the internet and has a vanguard of white knights to protect it. Still, you don't need too many blazing stones, and let's just quickly go over how the drops work for this. If you defeat it, you get a 35% chance at a blazing stone. Six of them knocked back into the Chimera, there's a 20% chance, and with nine of them it's 40%. I suppose maybe running around the rock and hitting them back in as they bounce around would give you more of these chances, so perhaps there is a bit more to this, but I still think number three is a more than fair place to put this one. At number 2 we have the Neo Shadow. These were seen for the first time in Another Side Another Story, the special secret at the end of the game. And in Final Mix they got added as actual enemies to fight. To start with that's pretty cool, fighting these things from the secret ending. Neo Shadows in the other games tend to be what they look like, stronger versions of shadows. But here in Cage 1 Final Mix, they've got a lot of abilities, it's a multi-stage fight. To start with the drop, it's very simple. There's a 35% chance of a Stormy Stone when you defeat it. Or rather, when you defeat the seventh, because these come in a group. The first phase of this fight has all seven Neo Shadows attacking you. They like to do this move which reminds me of a spin dash. And it can get a bit hectic. Once you defeat three of them, of course there's four left, they will move into phase two. This is where nine portals will appear on the ground. Out of these, the four Neo Shadows will jump up and attack and then sink back into the portals. You have a little bit of time after the attack to hit them and do the damage. So what you need to do is when one jumps out of a portal, focus on it, do as much damage as possible before it disappears, and keep doing that until you get down to only two left. In this third phase, one of the two left will attack you using moves from the previous phases. The other one is a bit of a prick and will come up from its portal to try and grab you and leave you open to being attacked. This also makes it harder to deal damage to the one that's attacking you. The way to avoid this is to simply jump, glide a lot, and just don't be on the ground too much. Aerial combos are the way to go here. When there is only one Neo Shadow left, time becomes crucial, because it will try and resummon six more. If you let all of these come out of the portals, you're back to the very first phase and starting over. So you need to focus on hitting these guys before they respawn. Just one hit is enough, so don't bother trying to fight the main one. If, for example, you miss one and it comes back, you'll be back to the third phase and dealing with two again. It's kind of smart, I think it's one of the most interesting mechanics for Heartless in the game. The fact that I can actually go back to different phases dynamically, it's a fairly unique thing. If you manage to stop all six from respawning, all that's left is to take out the final Neo Shadow, and that's not too difficult. These guys can be kind of brutal if you go in and they're underpowered, and even more so if you go in there without knowing what to do. I'm sure I've done it before, but to go to Linked Worlds and fight them like any other Heartless, not knowing what their moves are and what especially the last phase is capable of, that's an invitation for pain, you need to think a little bit about what you're doing. But when you do know, I think it's actually quite fun. It's like a mini boss in a way. The only real issue I have with this Heartless is the drop rate. I think 35% chance for beating this challenge is a bit low. I think it should be at least 60%, but honestly a guaranteed drop would be okay in my opinion. There's not really much point in repeating this. If you've managed to defeat them before they disappear, 
you've done well, so why should it be just a percentage chance? All that's doing is forcing the player to potentially do it more and then it gets grindy and tedious. Still, from the design to the concept to the mechanics, it earns its spot at number two. Finally, we have number one, and it is the Humble Pot Scorpion. First of all, we have an original design here. Yes, it's one of the pots, like the pot spiders, but instead of a spider, it's a scorpion, and scorpions are cool. I think the only issue here is again drop rate. It's a 20% chance of a mithril stone if you defeat the scorpion without destroying all the pots beforehand, and a 35% chance if you do destroy them. It's quite simple to see which one it is in amongst all these pots. The one that doesn't move when you push into it. Oh, and the final fake pot that you destroy itself has a 10% chance of dropping a mithril stone. I definitely think that 35% chance should be a bit higher. I've had a few occurrences of fighting the pot scorpion and multiple times getting nothing from it, which means the grinding takes longer. Aside from this, why is it my favourite? Well, I kind of like the fight, I like the mechanic. Once it's out of its pot, it will start throwing darkness balls everywhere. You don't want to stand in those, so a bit of positioning is called for. It has two physical attacks it can do. If you block them, it will be launched onto its back, and you get a few chances to hit it before its invincibility returns. So it's only open when you've parried it. You can use a roger and that will parry it, and it's generally the easiest way to do this. I like to try and block if I can, because even with a roger reflecting the hit, you'll still likely get staggered, which means it takes a little bit longer to get to the scorpion and hit it. It's also just fun to fight it properly. It has this big darkness pool attack where it sends them flying out in all directions. All in all though, quite a simple fight. Aside from some bad luck every now and then, it's a fairly smooth experience. And that's it, that's my ranking of the final mix Heartless. Let me know what you think of these guys down below. I know plenty of people don't particularly like them, but over the years I've come to appreciate them, or at least most of them. Do I mind going back and getting a few materials from them? No. Am I going to do Ultima again? Also, no, probably not, I have no real reason to. But I would say, if you put off Ultima, give these guys another try, you might find they're not as bad as you imagined. So that's it from me, stay tuned for other videos or catch me on stream, and as always, thanks for watching.